Welcome to um, May's Lunch and Learn series, where we'll be learning about the Waterbury um, cancellation stamps, which is not something that I know very much about, but I know someone who does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I won't take up any time. I'm going to let Charles talk. Um, enjoy the presentation. Um, and if anyone has their food or not, if you need anything, the art of is right behind. today in Waterbury. Uh, my name is Charles Epting. I'm the president of H.R. Harmer Fine Stamp Auctions uh, based in New York City. We're an auction house that's been around uh, since 1940, specializing in uh, just postage stamps and envelopes and anything having to do uh, with the history of the, um, of the post office in America. So, um, you know, Waterbury, I don't know if anybody, has anybody in the room heard of the fancy cancellations uh, from Waterbury, Connecticut? I've got a couple. Um, it's incredible because in the world of stamp collectors, Waterbury has this very prominent place. Waterbury uh, has this sort of uh, unique uh, reputation among stamp collectors as being home of some of the most beautiful, desirable, valuable envelopes that were ever produced uh, in the history um, again, of the U.S. mails. And it's, um, Waterbury, Waterbury to stamp collectors is, uh, is this sort of mecca. So the way this all uh, kind of started, um, a couple of months ago, my fiance Olivia, he's in the front row here, and uh, my colleague Alyssa as well, and, and Alyssa joined the team as our marketing manager a little more than a year ago, and something we've been trying to do. Um, stamp collectors, I'm sure a lot of you have uh, maybe a stereotypical image of a stamp collector, someone who's solitary, typically older, uh, you know, collects uh, you know, in a dark room by themselves. Maybe. <laughs> and we've been trying to sort of upend that image of stamp collectors. We've been trying to, uh, you know, bring some new life, some excitement into a hobby that is uh, at times maybe lacking those things. And we've tr been trying to do a lot more social media, a lot more outreach. And Olivia and I were sitting at home. I live in Dutchess County uh, in New York, so not too far from here. And we were sitting home one night and uh, talking about the, the cancellations that were produced um, in Waterbury in the 1860s and 70s, which I'll get to in the end, but um, we got to thinking, you know, where was the Waterbury Post Office located at the time these things were being produced? Where was the uh, post office, in, again, 1865, 1866? So I thought this would be easy. I thought I'd look up a directory and, uh, you know, be able to find the exact street address of the post office. But, uh, you know, some of the streets were rerouted. There were a couple of fires, things that made it very difficult to pinpoint just where the post office was. The other thing we came across a lot of the advertisements and trade cards use the post office as the focal point of Waterbury. So uh, if there was a department store, it would say two blocks north of the post office, but it wouldn't tell you where the post office was because everybody applied at the time. If they knew one building, it was the post office. So we embarked on this, this long quest that evening, uh, going through maps, directories, newspapers, trying to find the site of the post office, and that brought us to Waterbury late last year. We filmed a video tracing the location of the Waterbury Post Office. And after uh, creating that video, that was when we reached out to the museum. And uh, again, I'm just very happy to be able to uh, be here doing a, a presentation such as this. So before I get to Waterbury specifically, and, and Postmaster John Hill, who was the gentleman who created uh, these, these cancellations, I think it's important to just go over a very brief history of postage stamps in America. I think to figure out why Waterbury is important, we need to learn how we got there. Um, so I'm going to give a, a sort of quick crash course in how the postage stamp changed American history. It's something we all take for granted today, something that's even obsolete. People, I think the most common question I get is, uh, you know, people hear that I work for an auction house on historic stamps, and they just want to know what a first class stamp costs these days, to show you how, um, you know, low the bar is for knowledge. It's, I think, 63 cents currently. But um, again, how we got to where we were in the 1860s and certainly where we are today uh, is, is very important. So, the history of the postage stamp in America actually begins in Great Britain in the late 1830s. There was a social movement pioneered by a gentleman named Roland Hill. He's the father of the postage stamp. Uh, and he thought it was very important, uh, you know, postage rates prior to the 1830s, uh, both in the US and in Great Britain, were very complex and convoluted. And, you know, whether you were sending a letter across town in London or a letter from London to Wales or Scotland, you basically needed an atlas to figure out how much your letter was going to cost. And Roland Hill basically said a letter within the United Kingdom should cost the same 
whether it's going a few streets over or hundreds of miles. And he figured that the money that would be saved on short distances would be offset by the money lost on longer distances. He thought that access to writing letters, access to the mail was a fundamental human right. This is something that needed to be uh, equally accessible to all uh, you know, subjects of the crown. So um, in early 1840, it came a law that a one ounce letter sent between any two points would cost one penny uh, within the United Kingdom. This was an incredible, uh, an incredibly significant moment in British history uh, because again, sending a letter uh, throughout the United Kingdom was, was a very complex process before that. And now that it, it costs the same to send a letter anywhere within the, in the United Kingdom, uh, this paved the way for the postage stamp, a means of prepaying uh, for your letters. Previous to this, you had to go to the post office window every time you wanted to mail a letter. They would weigh it, calculate the distance, figure out what you had to pay. And you'd actually pay um, you know, in cash in person at the post office. Now that everything was standardized as one penny, you could buy up stamps in advance and use them you know, whenever, uh, whenever you wanted. And that way you could just drop your letter off at the post office. Um, you didn't have to worry about waiting in line. People were just as frustrated with uh, crowds at the post office back then as, as we are today. So that was in the UK in 1840. That made its way to America. People started hearing about the adhesive postage stamp, this tiny little invention uh, that took the world by storm. So the first postage stamps in America were not actually produced by the government. They were produced by local companies that were delivering mail cheaper, quicker, and more reliably than the government. Think about FedEx or UPS uh, versus the, the post office today. And just two years after the first stamps uh, came out in the United Kingdom, these private companies in New York and Philadelphia in particular started issuing their own adhesive postage stamps. So this would have been uh, people's introduction to the idea of sticking a little piece of gummed paper onto the corner of an envelope uh, in order to mail a letter. So um, again, this is, how people were introduced to the idea of a stamp in America was through private enterprise. The government was very quick to pick up on this though. And in 1845, the US followed in the United Kingdom's footsteps and decided to standardize postage rates uh, across America. So instead of these complex convoluted rates uh, based on both weight and distance, um, the government said essentially, if a letter weighs less than half an ounce and travels under 300 miles, it's five cents. If it's over half an ounce, uh, it'll be 10 cents, or if it's over 300 miles, it's 10 cents. So basically, a letter that could have cost 25 or 30 cents just a couple of years earlier would now cost five or 10 cents. Everything was much cheaper, everything was standardized, and again, just like in the UK, these standardized postage rates allowed for the sale of postage stamps. So you could actually prepay uh, your postage before you mail the letter. What I think is interesting is that the federal government did not immediately issue postage stamps. Instead, local postmasters in 11 different municipalities started creating postage stamps that were only valid for use at their respective post office. And the reason behind this, uh, I think, is really interesting. It's not because of any sort of uh, greater public good or any sort of you know, altruism. Um, a postmaster's financial compensation was based on how much business was done in his post office. So if you had a lot of mail being sent to your post office, the postmaster was making more money. Also at this time, if I was mailing you a letter, I could prepay upfront for that letter, or I could send it to collect, and you would have to pay the post office on delivery. Um, essentially, the post office was performing the service either way, whether or not they got paid. The person could easily refuse the letter on the other end, and then the post office is out there five cents. If a post office handled most of their mail and collect, that postmaster was performing the service of handling the mail without actually getting paid for it. So postage stamps were introduced in these 11 municipalities, New York, uh, Alexandria, Virginia, St. Louis, Missouri, as a way for postmasters to encourage prepayment of letters. Yes, it did make the experience uh, more palatable for the end user, but it also resulted in the postmasters making more money. So I think it's funny that really sort of the birth of the postage stamp in America came from um, you know, postmasters wanting to increase their salaries as much as anything else. Um, the federal government allowed this to go on. They didn't really approve or disapprove of these locally issued stamps um, for the next two years. Finally, in 1847, there was no denying, both in the UK and domestically through these provisional stamps, through the local stamps, the postage stamps were here to stay. These were going to become a fact of life uh, for the foreseeable future. 
1847, the federal government issued their first two postage stamps. The one on top, five cents, featured Benjamin Franklin, our nation's first postmaster general. Stamp on the bottom, 10 cents, uh, George Washington, our first president. So uh, these two men have still appeared on more stamps than, than anybody else in this country. Um, and they were sort of still experimental at this point. People were still not used to um, mailing letters with a postage stamp on them. People were just as happy going to the post office, giving them a nickel uh, uh, to pay for the letter. So uh, it, it took a little while. It took until about the mid-1850s for people to really cop on to this idea of using uh, postage stamps. Fast forward again to 1851. I think this is one of the um, uh, more amusing uh, periods of, of, of the history of the post office. Like I said, you could mail a letter, collect, or you could prepay for it. If the post office delivered the letter and the person didn't want to pay for it upon uh, receipt, the post office was out that money. So what the United States did, and the other thing I think is interesting, I, I didn't notice, but there was a business custom at the time. If I was mailing a letter to a client, I would think that prepaying for the letter would be a sign of respect. I respect you enough to pay for your mail. Um, but it's actually the opposite. If I prepaid for your letter, I was insulting your honor as a businessman. I was essentially saying, you're too poor to be able to afford a letter. So uh, by allowing you to pay for it yourself, I was, uh, you know, again, uh, complimenting your, your good business sense. The government saw this going on. They knew they were losing money. So they said, look, the only thing that will get people to prepay for their letters is if we make it cheaper to prepay for a letter than to send it to collect. So in 1851, the government said, if you prepay for the letter, it's three cents. If you send it, uh, you know, for payment on delivery, it's five cents. A 40% reduction in the cost of postage. Um, I think postage costs have gone up 50% in the last six or seven years. So the idea that they would actually reduce rates by 40% is unheard of today. And essentially, all of America's uh, business people got together and said, look, we don't want to insult anyone's honor. We also want to save 40%. So the frugality uh, outweighed the the question of honor. Um, and that was why postage rates were reduced in 1851. This opened the way, uh, you sort of paved the way to more and more people being able to, uh, to send mail. In 1855, the government mandated that all mail sent, all mail being sent uh, be prepaid with a postage stamp. So 1855 is when stamps become the law of the land. You can no longer send a letter uh, without a postage stamp. Another thing we don't think about, 1857, the government started perforating postage stamps. Nowadays, you picture a postage stamp, it has perforations. That's just a part of what a stamp is. But prior to 1857, um, a sheet of stamps would have looked just like a normal piece of paper, and postmasters uh, would have to cut the stamps apart with scissors, which was a slow process, uh, not a very precise way to, um, uh, to get stamps out to people. So, um, you know, little things like the development of perforations in the late 1850s uh, are the sort of milestones into the, uh, to the ubiquity of, of postage stamps. And then very quickly, uh, sort of the last milestone we'll hit until we get to Waterbury, uh, is the American Civil War. Uh, the American Civil War can be looked at a number of different ways. You know, every historian takes a different approach to the Civil War. When you think about it from a, from a postal standpoint, it's particularly interesting because the southern states were filled with United States postage stamps. And when the war broke out, they're not enemy combatants, but they have United, you know, postage stamps are US currency, they are valid uh, as valid as a, as a dollar bill, basically. So in the South, there was a lot of, or in the North, there was concern that the Southerners would sell these postage stamps, uh, you know, via an intermediary, via Europe or something, uh, and use the postage stamps that they had to fund the war effort. So Montgomery Blair, uh, who was Abraham Lincoln's postmaster general, immediately said, all postage stamps issued to this point are no longer valid for postage. There was a six day window where you had to take your postage stamps to the post office and exchange them for newly issued postage stamps. Uh, something similar went on in the UK last year where they decided that all postage stamps needed a QR code on them. So people in the UK had to take their stamps to the post office and swap them out for uh, the new barcoded stamps. Same thing in 1861. You had a couple of days to take all your old stamps to the post office, get the new stamps. If you didn't exchange them in time, your old stamps were no longer valid for postage. So, uh, it's actually really interesting. All postage stamps printed in the United States from 1861 to the present day are still valid for postage. You could take a stamp, print it during the Civil War, put it on a letter with enough other stamps, and it would still <laughs> legally carry the mail. Um, but I, I think it's just interesting to think about how 
again, you've got uh, you know, people on both sides trying to mobilize troops, trying to move supplies, and Montgomery Blair is sitting around saying, we have to make new postage stamps uh, in the middle of uh, you know, the most, most horrible uh, war that this country had ever seen until that point. So um, that paves the way for Waterbury, for Postmaster John Hill. Um, he was born in 1834, moved to Waterbury uh, early on in his life. Um, served early on in the Civil War, but was discharged. He actually became a regimental postmaster uh, later on in the war. Um, he moved back to Waterbury and became a postal clerk uh, not long after the Civil War ended. He was named postmaster in 1869. He remained in the Postal Service until his death uh, in 1921. So a very long, prestigious postal career here in Waterbury. Uh, he's actually buried in Waterbury. What's the cemetery? Sort of in the shade of the freeway. Riverside? Riverside Cemetery. Uh, we found his grave. We got lost in the cemetery. Uh, and a very nice gentleman, a groundskeeper, uh, pointed us. I, I said, we're looking for the postman. And somebody had actually told him where the old postman was buried. So he, uh, he saved us that day. We would have been there uh, for at least another couple of hours trying to find um, John Hill's grave. The last bit of um, uh, sort of stage dressing before we get to the Waterbury cancellations is the idea of what a cancellation actually is. So early on in the history of postage stamps, um, if you look at a letter like this, you can see that Mid-Peak, Massachusetts, for example, there's the part of the cancellation that has the city or town name, it has the state, and it has the date in it. Um, early on, that's called a, a town cancel or a, a, a circular date stamp. It's got a lot of uh, sort of fancy names within the philatelic world. Um, and early on, postmasters have actually used that cancellation in order to obliterate or invalidate the stamp. The post office noticed really quickly, though, that it became difficult to read the name of the town, it became difficult to read the date uh, if it was on a stamp, especially if there were stamps that were being printed in black ink or dark blue ink, and you couldn't really read when something was sent. And the entire point of using a postmark like this is for accountability, it's to know where a letter originated and how long it took to get to its destination. So um, in the 1850s, 1860s, uh, the post office started uh, mandating that the, uh, the town mark, the, the circular date stamp with the town name, uh, not touch the stamp, that it be postmarked onto the stamp, uh, <laughs> onto the cover away from the stamp, and that you needed a separate device or a device that was uh, you know, two parts in order to obliterate and validate the stamp. Early on, many of these devices, they're called killers by stamp collectors because they're basically killing the stamp, you can't use it again. Um, early on, they're mostly circles, blobs. Um, in Britain, they use little Maltese crosses. You see all sorts of designs, but I think a lot of postmasters, uh, to be completely blunt, have a lot of free time. Uh, you know, you're, you're in a small town that's not handling much mails. You're uh, you know, postmarking letters day in and day out. And if you had any sort of creative event, if you had any sort of uh, creative streak within you, you started thinking that this killer, this little cancellation for the postage stamp, is a canvas, it's a medium for artistic expression. So postmasters across the United States, you see these all the way in California, Nevada, uh, you know, not long after the gold rush, all the way you know, to the Northeast where we are here. Um, postmasters started creating little designs that they used to postmark the stamp. These are called fancy cancellations because they're fancier than, again, just your typical um, blob or cross or something like that. So here's a couple of examples. You can see a star from New York City used um, right around the time of the Civil War. This all-seeing eye from mid Massachusetts, a lot of postmasters were Freemasons. They would incorporate uh, you know, compasses and all-seeing eyes and other Masonic imagery into their cancellations. Um, and the bottom one, you can see also from New York, has the word union uh, inside of Starburst. So, a lot of these designs expressed pro-Union sentiment during the Civil War. You'll see little soldiers' heads, you'll see little eagles, you'll see little waving flags. And there was no postal purpose to these. No, the stamp would have been just as invalidated and obliterated if it was uh, you know, just, a, just a circle. Um, but again, I, I think especially postmasters who may have had some downtime and had an artistic proclivity um, viewed this as a way to um, maybe even just spread a little bit of joy with whoever was receiving the letter. I think in a lot of cases, you know, sometimes it was political, sometimes it was social, other times it was just, uh, you know, the, the purest form of artistic expression. That brings us back to Postmaster John Hill in Waterbury. He was known to be art, uh, arti artistic. Um, there are stories of him carving designs uh, on a fishing trip. He would take the top of a cane, whittle a bust of President Grant on the top of a cane. 
he would take a piece of wood and carve an entire chain into it. He would actually carve the links out of one piece of wood. Um, I don't have the patience for the uh, <laughs> artistry to do something like that. Um, so while he was postmaster of Waterbury, he would actually um, take little pieces of cork or wood and carve designs into them to uh, postmark his mailbox. He did this before he became postmaster when he was just a postal clerk in the mid-1860s, and then once he became postmaster in 1869, uh, he really just took off and his designs become more complex uh, and more creative. Sometimes we can tell what inspired one of his cancellations. You can see here uh, little baseball bats with three bases and a baseball. Uh, this was inspired by a local baseball game. I think it was the Natatuck Nine versus another local team. Um, he just wanted to celebrate the, the local baseball game. Uh, the one on top is known as the Bridgeport Firemen. There was a, a great fireman including uh, you know, a, a company from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, you can see a little VF in his, uh, in his, in his hat or helmet uh, for the Bridgeport Firemen. Um, and these cancellations are on a different level than anybody else. This is why Waterbury is such an important uh, site for, for American postal historians. It's because other towns maybe created one or two different designs. Brattleboro, Vermont, for example, uh, has, some, has some great designs. And there's other towns that are known for one or two interesting cancellations. John Hill's designs from Waterbury, there are hundreds of different designs. Some of them are very simple geometric designs, maybe little diamonds or uh, you know, little grids, little hearts or something. Others are really works of folk art. You look at Bridgeport Fireman, it's no different than a quilt or a carving that would have been done at the same time. Uh, only his medium was the mail. His medium was something that was actually seen by more people than many other uh, you know, forms of art. And I think that's really interesting that he used um, sort of the most, in a way, the most mundane um, uh, uh, canvas template um, for his art. This is, you know, people were sending mail in order to, you know, sometimes even we'll find the original letter inside these envelopes and it'll be a business in It'll be, I need to order, you know, uh, X uh, number of, of feet of lumber. And yet it'll have a little baseball diamond on it. It'll have a dog, uh, stolen crossbones. Um, these are some of the more beautiful, um, uh, and I think exciting water rate cancellations. And they run the gamut from sort of the mundane to the, uh, to the sublime, I would say. And uh, these are really some of the, the key iconic items um, to have come out of Waterbury. So at the top left, you can see uh, a very interesting, beautiful looking profile of a dog. This is one of the ones where we have no idea what was going on in the office that day or in, in Postmaster Hill's uh, imagination <coughs> that day. Maybe he was just, maybe he saw a dog walking down the street. The post office is, was, you know, literally two or three blocks from here, and, and maybe he was just inspired um, by something he saw on the street. The one below it is one of the numerous men with hats that he would carve, he seemed to like this motif. Uh, men wearing derbies, men wearing bowlers, men wearing top hats. He carved all different number of men uh, wearing hats. But what's special about this one is the envelope itself was produced uh, to support the Union during the Civil War. This was sort of a cottage industry that uh, sprung up in 1861, 1862, you started seeing it, where if you wanted to express your support of the union, you didn't take to Facebook or Twitter, you put it on your mail. You would go buy envelopes uh, supporting Abraham Lincoln, you'd buy envelopes supporting uh, your individual state in the union, and this was your way of broadcasting, you know, I, I, I am a, a, a proud northerner, I'm a proud unionist, uh, and they would actually put it on their mail like this. So this is uh, the only cover with a Waterbury fancy cancellation that also has a Civil War patriotic design. Um, it was sent very, at the very end of the war, I think that's April of uh, 65, so essentially the month the war ended. Postmaster Hill created a number of different skulls and crossbones. Uh, these things have all been cataloged and researched by various collectors over the years, and sometimes the differences are, are minute. You don't know if the cork just broke that day. Um, and, you know, that, some of the skulls have a larger nose, some of them have um, you know, bigger eye sockets, and it may have just been the natural wear and tear <laughs> that a piece of cork would take. Most of these cancellations were only in use for a week or two max. Um, others, they're only known for two or three days before presumably um, the cork broke. Typically, the more intricate the design, the shorter the period of use. Um, so you can sort of watch them evolve over the course of their lifespan. The ones that are very early on, um, 
you know, have, have more detail. This center one, the woman in her snood hood, um, there's only two or three examples of this known. It was used for a very, very short time. Um, and it's even more interesting, there's no entire envelopes known with this cancellation. The way that people have collected stamps has sort of evolved over time. Back in the 19th, early 20th centuries, people just wanted stamps. And they would take old correspondences that go around to family saying, do you have any old letters? And they would soak the stamps in water to get the stamps off of the envelopes and then just line their albums with rows and rows of stamps. As the 20th century progressed, um, collectors realized that, you know what, the postmark, <coughs> the addressee, the original content are all part of the story. These are all things that can make something uh, more valuable. Uh, you know, I'm sure many of us in this room um, are, are cringing at the idea of taking one of these letters and just removing the stamp off to, to stick it in <coughs> an album. Uh, so you're losing so much of the story. So the woman in Snoot Hood, this is a corner of an envelope that was cut off. And that's actually the largest known example of this cancellation. There's no <laughs> envelopes in existence that, uh, that, that feature her um, somewhat unflattering uh, profile, I would say. Um, the stamp at the top right, no one really knows what it is. Um, historically, stamp collectors have referred to it as a zebra. I can kind of see it if I squint, otherwise it looks like it could be a horse or some other sort of animal. Uh, but this got me to asking Olivia one of the weirder questions I've ever asked. I came to her and I said, would somebody in Waterbury, Connecticut in the late 1860s have even known what a zebra was? Because it weren't really zoos yet. Get, getting zebras to America was, was very difficult. And I started looking, there were no real circuses with zebras at the time. Um, Maybe people would have seen illustrations in a book, but what's really interesting, P.T. Barnum's Museum in New York City actually had zebras on display in the late 1860s. These were the first live zebras ever brought to America. P.T. Barnum's Museum's in New York uh, infamously burnt down a number of times, killing many of the animals he would keep on display. And there's a, a wonderful engraving that appeared in Harper's Weekly, I believe it was, showing the devastation of P.T. Barnum's Museum. And front and center, there is a zebra that looks conspicuously similar to, to this zebra. I, I think it was you actually who found the illustration, Olivia. I think the Bridgeport Museum. It was, so I, I, and then I thought, I, I thought, where was this illustration reproduced? And it was reproduced in Bridgeport. There would have been some awareness of zebras in Waterbury in the late 1860s, uh, even amongst the general population. So whether or not it's a zebra, ultimately, I think that's a secret that uh, John Hill probably took to the grave with him. Um, but I like to imagine that somebody may have opened the newspaper, seen this uh, zebra fleeing the carnage of P.T. Barnum's museum, and said, hey, John, why don't you carve these for the mail? Um, beneath it, much more self-explanatory, you can see this letter was sent February 14th. Uh, this would have been in the early 1870s, and it has a heart of an arrow going through it. Every Valentine's Day, John Hill uh, seems to have liked to create um, a new, fun uh, heart with an arrow, or um, circle of hearts around a little star. He did a, a sort of commemorative cancellation for each Valentine's Day. Um, I think it's especially fun when they're postmarked on Valentine's Day. You can only imagine um, uh, you know, what was in some of these letters, whether it was a, a love letter. We had a letter from Hartford, Connecticut uh, earlier this year that we sold. The recipient was a young girl who was five years old and it was her father sending her a Valentine for Valentine's Day. And the original Valentine was still with the letter that was postmarked, uh, the envelope that was postmarked Valentine. Day. So um, again, I think the Valentine's Day ones are always uh, really special because you can think about the thought and meaning that went into each of them. The bottom right is not just the most famous envelope ever mailed from Waterbury, but I would argue it might be the most famous envelope ever mailed within the United States. This is called the running chicken uh, for somewhat obvious reasons. Um, and the running chicken, for whatever reason, has become uh, sort of John Hill's Mona Lisa. This is his defining <laughs> masterpiece as an artist. Um, there's a number of different envelopes that have the running chicken cancellation on them. What makes this one so special, you can see there's three stamps. They are all one cent. The, the first class postage rate in the country uh, in the late 1860s, early 1870s was three cents. So typically, people would send a letter with one three cent stamp, like the skull and crossbones, and you would get one cancellation on the cover to obliterate the one stamp. 
whether they uh, just wanted it to look a little bit prettier or they only had one cent stamps with them. This letter was sent with three one cent stamps, which means that John Hill had to use his running chicken uh, three different times. So the fact that it has the repetition of the postmark, the fact that it was early on in the postmark's life, these are some of the finest examples of the running chicken. Um, this envelope uh, for the last hundred plus years has been uh, this icon of American postal history. It was first discovered, uh, I want to say in the early 1900s, and a dealer bought it for a dollar, uh, which was sort of an unheard of sum for an envelope at that time. Um, traded hands a couple of times in the 60s and 70s for exorbitant six-figure sums. And then we were fortunate enough to offer it last year at auction. And I want to say, $365,000 for, uh, for this envelope. Um, it is, again, just one of those iconic items that every stamp collector in America has grown up seeing pictures of in books. Uh, when I got involved, I've been with HR Armour for seven years. When I started, I never thought that I would get to see it in person, let alone uh, hold it and have it in my possession for a couple of months. But um, if you ask any stamp collector in America, essentially, about Waterbury, this is the envelope that they will uh, that they will immediately picture um, because it's this combination of rarity and beauty. The other thing I'll mention about it, uh, everybody see the date, November 29th? What usually falls around November 29th? Thanksgiving, exactly. There is some thought that it may have been a Thanksgiving turkey, maybe running away from a butcher. Um, but at the same time, it's a common motif in newspaper advertisements of a little running chicken um, chasing after a bug, typically trying to catch a bug to eat. So um, and whether it was, a, running, whether it was a, a turkey running away from, a, from an axe, whether it was inspired by advertisements, I actually looked through Connecticut newspapers trying to find an advertisement around this date using this motif to see if we can connect the dots and figure out definitively uh, what John Hill was inspired by. Um, I haven't been able to find that link yet, but regardless, this is um, one of the most beautiful and celebrated envelopes ever mailed ever in the history of America. Uh, and then I just want to talk really quickly about sort of the history of the Waterbury postmarks after they were created. So John Hill essentially stopped making these things in the 1870s. Postmarks at that point um, became very standardized. You could buy them out of a catalog and have your town name and uh, again, just a, a standard little target or oval or something to cancel the mail. Um, so fancy cancellations essentially go away by the 1870s. John Hill uh, no longer has an outlet for his artistic expression, um, but continues to work for the post office. It wasn't until the early 1900s that people started realizing that something had been going on in Waterbury a couple of decades earlier. Most of these letters ended up in family correspondences. They were just stuck away in shoeboxes and attics. And nobody, I don't think, uh, comprehended just how many different designs had been created. Uh, by John Hill over the period of about 10 or 15 years. The first ever checklist and reference guide to water cancellations was actually published by the Mattituck Historical Society in 1938. This was one of, uh, one of their early monographs uh, that they put out. I think the connection to the, the present day museum is, is absolutely incredible. And as you can see, some of the designs that I, I showed were, um, were known to collectors as early as the 1930s. There's the running chicken at number 62. You can see the skull and crossbones at number 67. Um, some of these have since been proven uh, to be fake. The elephant, for example, number 47, nobody thinks the elephant actually existed. Everyone thinks that that is actually a forgery because as soon as people started realizing these were collectible and valuable, people started making fake water rate cancellations. Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting one I want to mention, just to see here, number 50, the AJ on the tombstone, was carved in commemoration or celebration of Andrew Johnson's impeachment. Um, so uh, sort of a, a overtly political message from John Hill who typically stayed away from, um, from, from such things. Um, again, that was to, to honor the, uh, the impeachment. He also created a cancellation in 1876 that's the number 100, celebrating the centennial uh, of, of the country. He would create postmarks with the number of um, electoral votes the different presidential candidates would receive. So um, again, the, this, this early checklist uh, is a very important stepping stone in the history of the study uh, and appreciation of Waterbury cancellations. And then to end, I want to focus on uh, this gentleman. His name is Harry Monacowa. 
Um, Eric von Haub was a, a German businessman who passed away in 2018. Um, over the past four or so years, H.R. Harmer has been fortunate enough to handle his stamp collection. <laughs> a lot of people wonder why a German businessman happens to have all of the important Waterbury cancellations in existence. And it's actually a fascinating story. Eric von Haub's fortune came from the supermarket industry. So when he was a teenager in the 1950s, his family did not want him to um, just inherit the company and, and not know what went into running supermarkets. So they shipped him to Southern California. I think he was 14, 15 years old. They stuffed him in an A&P supermarket, if anybody remembers A&P. And they had him stock shelves. He was putting cans on the shelves, even though his family was one of the wealthiest in, in post-war Germany. And when he was in America as a young boy, he uh, very quickly became taken by uh, American history, especially the more um, sort of romantic aspects of American history. Pony Express, the Civil War, uh, and he started collecting stamps, and he, his stamp collecting reflected those, uh, those early passions he developed. He also had an eye for art. His uh, art collection was donated to um, the University of Tacoma in Washington. There's an entire wing of their art museum that's his early Western art. So I think for him, fancy cancellations were this perfect intersection of American history and beauty, because there's a lot of great stamps and envelopes that we sell that are not necessarily beautiful. They may have a great story, but they, they don't look like much to the, uh, to the untrained eye. The, canc the fancy cancellations, and in particular those from Waterbury, are the exact opposite. You can show the running chickens to anyone and it puts a smile on their face because, uh, I mean, I don't know. I will. Yeah, you can, yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think even today it would bring a smile to our face to receive a piece of mail with little chickens canceling the, uh, the postage stamp. So, uh, Eric von Howe spent decades and decades of his life putting together um, one of the greatest collections of American postal history ever. Um, again, he unfortunately passed away, uh, he was in his mid-80s in, in 2018, and we've been handling his collection ever since, which has allowed many of these Waterbury cancellations. On the one hand, I think it's wonderful that he collected them and was able to acquire them. Uh, on the other hand, they all ended up in Germany, uh, which is uh, a long ways away from, from Waterbury. And I, I think it's been great to be able to bring them back to the States, be able to offer them to a new generation of collectors. And uh, I think it's wonderful, you know, again, of all the things that, that are in his collection, uh, the, the envelopes from, from Waterbury have attracted arguably the most attention of all. Uh, so I think it's wonderful that Postmaster Hill's legacy is carried on. People still appreciate these things. We put the running chickens on the front cover of one of our auction catalogs. And I think that these will continue to be popular with collectors for many, many years to come. And I think it's wonderful that one humble postal servant from Waterbury uh, has had such a profound impact on tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of collectors uh, you know, all these decades later. So I want to end by mentioning Harry Von Howe. I think it's interesting. Sometimes it takes an outsider to appreciate our own history better than we do. I always use the example that um, I've actually never been to the Statue of Liberty, even though I live in New York, because it takes a tourist from out of town coming to you know, get you to explore your own backyard. So I think Eric von Howe, the German businessman, uh, you know, appreciated these, these cancellations more than a lot of American collectors, and that's why, uh, again, they all ended up in his collection. But nowadays, uh, it's a lot of fun for us to be able to, uh, to find new homes for them. So the last, last slide is, like I said, this video that I made uh, trying to find what I call the most important building in stamp collecting because stamp collectors, I don't want to criticize stamp collectors because they are you know, both my, my clients and my friends, um, but I think there's, if there's one problem a lot of stamp collectors have is that they get too focused on what is in their stamp album, what's going on inside the four walls of their own home, and they don't actually uh, go out and try to contextualize the history of the American Post inside the larger fabric of American history. So um, again, this is, it all started that one night. Olivia and I were, were thinking we've handled you know hundreds of, of cancellations from Waterbury. We've seen all the great iconic items pass through our hands, but where were they created? Where did they come from? I wrote a couple of people who uh, specialize in the postal history of Connecticut, and they told me that they actually never thought about where the post office was located. The, the world-renowned experts at the subject are so focused on the pieces of paper themselves that they forget that these aren't just pieces of paper, they're mail. They originated somewhere, they were sent from somewhere, they were delivered to somewhere. Um, and I, I, I think that's that's why, uh, in my opinion, does anybody recognize that building? It's, uh, it's across the street from, oh, I'm, I'm blind, I should have 
It's on Main Street. What's the, 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 the one that's at the center of the street? Um, the Apothecary's Hall. Apothecary's Hall, thank you. Uh, Apothecary's Hall is actually where Postmaster Hill bought his ink to uh, cancel the map just across the street to buy um, stocks of ink there. So um, if you look at this building, street view, it was one thing when we visited it a couple months ago. It was another thing, I think, even since then it's uh, changed hands again. It's sort of a, a transient building. Um, but in my opinion, this is one of, if not the most important buildings in Stamp Lighting. This is where the running chickens were carved. This is where the Bridgeport Firemen uh, was carved. And, and like I said, we also visited um, Postmaster Hill's grave as well. I think it's important to uh, make him as much a focal point of the story as possible. So um, this YouTube video is available. Um, if anyone would like the link, um, you can write us and we'll send it to you. Um, but with that, that concludes my talk about the Waterbury fancy cancellations. Um, we do have brochures that we published recently called The Romance of Postal History. I tried to write a, a primer uh, to postal history that is accessible to non-collectors. I think so many people, especially in the, the stamp auction industry, uh, only preach to the choir, they only play to their own audience. Uh, and I wanted to write a, a brochure that uh, could be read by people, maybe with just a passing familiarity uh, you know, with the subject. So if any of you would like a copy of that, we've got those up here. Um, but otherwise, I want to thank you all again for, for joining me this afternoon. If you have any questions, I'd be uh, more than happy to, to hear them. I'm starting back now. Chris, that was outstanding. I mean, the research you did is just remarkable. So, so interesting and insightful. And um, you mentioned a couple of things, um, you know, cringing at the idea, what's your term? I am uh, cringing at the idea that our family has probably thrown out tons of mail that, um, you know, sorry, sorry, um, tons of mail that was <coughs> historical, and my grandfather was an avid uh, stamp collector, and he was the battalion chief of the Waterbury Fire Department, so very close proximity at the time, but the other thing I was thinking as you were writing, I mean, reading, uh, talking, excuse me, um, it's amazing the cursiveness, I noticed the handwriting and the calligraphy and the artistic nature of people taking the time to, to write a letter. That is such a lost art. That in itself is such a lost art. And I love that. I, you know, do that kind of writing, so I appreciate seeing it. And, you know, even the filling in of the, the some of the letters with the black. I remember getting some, or my mom getting them and reading from my Aunt Mary and looking at the envelope going, this is beautiful, you know? Um, and then I thought of like the courts and his artistic, um, how he, you know, art can be found in so many different things. Um, and I was wondering who drank all those bottles of wine or whatever that <laughs> made the courts from, <laughs> you know? There's all kinds of things that you created in my head, but. Um, Absolutely, no, I, I, I think that the, the handwriting is, is, I mean, I'll see, um, people would often take an envelope and just do it, they had to do it in simple edition or something. They would do that on the back of an envelope and their you know, doodling was much nicer than my uh, best handwriting. Um, it goes to the Mad Tech Museum for you know, having you and, and being one of the folks really that, yeah. you know, portrayed this in, in, the, in the museum. It was just, it's amazing. Thank you very much. No, thank you, thank you. My comment was much more simplistic. <laughs> Every time you put the running chicken, it appeared as a tree. Did it always appear as a tree? It didn't. So, so the, the, there's maybe eight or ten other running chickens in existence, and every other one, it's a little three cent uh, blue stamp with just one running chicken on it. So those are, uh, you know, highly desirable, highly prized by collectors, but you only get one. This one you get, you know, three times. Is the tree worth more than one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, typically, the more times that the cancellation was used, um, you know, in terms of the the postal aspect, three one cent stamps and one three cent stamp are exactly the same thing. This is purely an aesthetic uh, choice by collectors to uh, again to value three of the chickens more than more than one of the chickens. So, um, yeah, it's just a, a weird fluke that this one letter happened to have three of them, and uh, again, that stands you know um, uh, far above we any other. Listed the other cancellation. So if I went to a philatelic conference and said I was from Waterbury, I would be like a god. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, yes, there, you would be. There, there's this disproportionate.
disproportionate uh, <laughs> focus on water. Again, it, it, it's it's um, it's a, 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 a city name we see come up um, time and time again. So no, I, I, um, actually next summer the American Philatelic Society is the, the national largest national um, postage stamp uh, society in America. That's about twenty five thousand members, and their annual convention moves every year. Next August it's going to be held in Hartford, not far from here. So. Right. <laughs> The documents from 38 that we still upstairs because I'm ready to sell. <laughs> well, I told them for his business, so if you want to come along, if there's anything. Uh, we used to have stacks and stacks of all those. Oh, I think if you have anything, but six digits. I think uh, Michael and there are going to come along. Six digits, we will have to walk. I, I think it would be fun. Hartford's you know, not, not too far at all. I think it would be fun to, um, to get a group together during the convention next year to come to the Mad Tuck Museum. If we have something we can discuss, sure, do a little walking tour of downtown, go to the side of the post office, visit uh, you know, Mr. Mary. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to talk to them about that. I think it would be fun to do a day trip for people uh, to Waterbury. It's way, it's water break or way too close not to, uh, not to do something. So. That's very true. Uh, um, what are some of the other cities? Yeah, so we have a, w w Waterbury is, is the most famous. There's a, a very high concentration in New England, though. Like I said, Brattleboro, Vermont is the big one. Um, Hockenham, Connecticut uh, had a little box that they used. Um, so, some towns only use one or two different devices. So the Hockenham box is another big one. Um, you know, larger post offices, Boston, New York, just by the virtue of how much mail they were sending. Uh, typically have a bit more diversity in their postmarks, um, but there's a, there's a, a concentration in New England. I, I, true, most mail uh, in the 1860s was originating from this part of the country. The population is still very heavily focused. Um, but you still see them from you know, Virginia City, Nevada, which was not much of anything. It was a boom town in the 1860s. Mark Twain lived there, um, but even they were carving little pro-Union messages during the Civil War. Um, you see stuff from. Uh, really all corners of the globe, even, um, uh, I would say every state has at least one town that, that expressed their creativity like this, but um, yeah, in terms, I, I think Rattleboro is maybe the one that most closely compares to Waterbury, and they had maybe five or ten different designs versus Waterbury's you know, 200. And who was their name? There, so they actually had a couple of different postmasters. I, I was reading about this recently, where they, they uh, John, John Hill was the postmaster here for, for a long, long time. Brattleboro swapped out, but each new postmaster sort of carried on the artistic tradition uh, of their predecessors. But you know, a lot of times these things weren't, uh, nobody expected that we were gonna be 150 years talking about them uh, in Waterbury. This is something that John Hill probably did. Again, a lot of it was just to kill time and to maybe brighten people's days. So, there's no uh, no real. Um, I, I've scoured newspapers looking for any mention of fancy cancellations. Did any uh, you know columnist <laughs> remark upon the fact that uh, you know mail out of um, Canton, Mississippi had a little uh, uh, little like a loop, like a little musical instrument on it? Uh, and, and there's really not much contemporaneous documentation of these things. So we're just left putting the pieces together. Um, again, we're really, you know, it's one of the interesting things about collecting stamps and collecting, especially stamps on their original envelopes. Um, baseball cards were produced to be collected. Comic books were produced to be collected. Action figures, you name it. Um, stamps were not produced to be collected. I think a lot of collectors sometimes forget that these were intended to be obliterated and then thrown away. Uh, there's really no reason um, to keep your mail back then. Um, so, uh, I, I think that's one of the interesting things, is these, these weren't meant to have the staying power. These weren't meant to, um, uh, to be around all these decades later. And it makes it sort of, on one hand, it's a great challenge to try and figure out where these things were made and why they were made and who made them. And uh, on the other hand, it's frustrating that uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of dead ends. And again, who knows what that little zebra is, for example. We're going to collect it, and there's only one of those in existence. That's the only envelope with the zebra on it. Uh, there's another one I was looking at yesterday with a little pig on it. The only pig that John Hill ever created. Um, did you see a pig on a farm one day? I think that would make a good cancellation for the mail. We don't know. I'm just curious if you've looked into any uh, family, you know, like history here of people that are still, you know, around from that particular family. Like, you know, trace back. Do they know the significance? Do they know the significance of their? Family? We were discussing this on the drive over. I, I, I don't believe. We know that John Hill was ever married, so I don't know if he had any direct descendants himself. 
um, or if there were other people in town. But I, again, I, I would love like a yeah, brothers and sisters. But I was going to say my, my, my dream is, is some sort of parents. diary or journal where somebody's like, today John Wayne Carter did something. Or disgruntled employees. Yes. Yes. He's wasting our time. He's done something. Um, you know, people have been researching this for almost 100 years now, and, uh, and, and as far as I know, no one's been able to come up with anything like that. So it could still exist, um, but, but who knows what's, uh, what's out there. Um, when did fancy cancellations kind of go out of style? Um, you so, don't see them now. No, so, so fancy cancellations have a, an interesting history. Um, as uh, I, I think I mentioned, Postal devices started becoming standardized around the late 1870s, early 1880s, where you would buy what's called a duplex because the part that had the town name and the part that would cancel the stamp were part of the same device. It was essentially a, a two point you know, duplex um, device. And those you would order either directly from the post office or there were companies that sprung up that would produce these um, you know, for post offices to buy. So once you had major companies mass producing these things, that stripped a lot of the creativity away right around 1880. The interesting second chapter to fancy cancellations, though, um, does anybody, I'm sure some people remember registered mail. Uh, nowadays it's called, I think, priority mail. Express is the equivalent of a registered mail. Or is there actually there's still a registered mail? What am I saying? I should know that better than anyone. <laughs> um, registered mail basically means that every step of the way, every postal employee that handles it has to postmark it to leave a record of its you know, chain of command. And the thing with registered mail is the postmarks have to be on the back of the envelope over the flap, of the, over the seal, to prove that the envelope was not opened or tampered with. And there's a regulation that registered mail cannot bear a postmark with a date or the town name on the front of the envelope. All of the dated postmarks have to be on the back. So in the 1920s, a couple of postmasters started to pick up on this loophole where they needed to create devices to cancel the stamps that couldn't have their town name or anything. So you'd get postmasters who would start making shamrocks for um, St. Patrick's Day, or they'd make um, uh, a postmark that suggested the town name, so I think White Horse, Oklahoma, whatever. Uh, little, yeah. Apple took Wisconsin, exactly. It was a little apple with the letters T-O-N afterward. So it sort of skirted <laughs> the law by not having the date or the name of the town. Um, but by the 1920s and 1930s, there were, stamp collecting was much more a thing than it was in John Hill's day. So these postmarks were not created uh, for purely postal purposes. Postmasters would create sort of a uh, sort of a side gig where they would sell mail directly to collectors with these beautiful fancy postmarks on them. So the post office in the early 1930s very quickly stamped out this practice. They realized it was a commercial ploy again for postmasters to make an extra money on the side. So the original uh, heyday of, of fancy cancellations, sort of the 1850s to 1880, and then they spring up again, 1925 to 1935. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, everything basically gets sped through a machine uh, with a spread for cancellation. Sometimes they have a little, you know, season's greetings or something in them that is uh, analogous to a fancy cancellation without any of the individual, uh, you know, passion that went into these things. So yeah, that would, by, by sort of the 1880s, they were. Any other questions? So it's not like really like against postal regulations to do that at this point. It's just not efficient. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it wasn't breaking any laws. The only law was that you had to um, cancel the stamp in such a way that it could not be used again. Um, I, I, I wonder if the post office was frustrated thinking that their employees were sitting around you know, uh, carving little pieces of lead and work rather than. Uh, but again, again, a lot of the smaller offices that were just being down. The boy might want to like stir up the collector's community to throw, throw one out there today. Ooh. Just, like, call it a <laughs> um, You can actually go through the post office to get a pictorial postmark if you have a uh, festival or a parade or something going on in town. So it might be fun to create a modern okay. day. Both uh, machine lets you run a special things yeah. like that. Yeah, that's really Yes, yeah, so that might be a fun idea for um, for next year with, in conjunction with the, with the stamp check stuff. So. Now, thank you all again for, for joining me. <laughs>